With our Bibles turned open to Mark, we start in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Today, we embark on a journey through the gospel of Mark with an overview or a, a general overview of the entire book. Today we start with Mark. We're not going to waste any time wondering why. For knowing Christ Jesus is the heart of everything for us here at Trinity Fellowship. And while we do not hold that there are portions of Scripture that are more or less inspired than others, we do hold that no Christian, no Christian should ever stray or wander too far from these precious four Gospels, for in them we find the savor of Christ in every single word. In the Gospels, we meet his person, and we find that he's sweet. And that sweetness, the sweetness of the name of Jesus, it's precious to a believer's ear, as the hymn so sang years and years ago. So no, no need to wonder why we're studying Mark. We're studying Mark so as to look into and unto Jesus, and this morning as we embark on this study with a general overview, we're simply going to ask two questions of this book, two questions of this book as we begin to embark upon it. Those two questions are these, who is its author and what is his theme? Who is the author of the gospel according to Mark and what is his great theme? Question number one, who wrote the gospel of Mark? Of course, we believe that God is the author of Mark's gospel. We hold that all of scripture, that is all 66 books in the Bible, are the product of one single divine mind, God's. And all 66 books of this Bible, they are authoritative. What that means, when we say the Bible is authoritative, that means to obey the scriptures is to obey God himself. And to disobey the scriptures is to disobey God himself. We also hold to the truth that these 66 books are inerrant. What does that mean? That means they are totally and completely without error. Every word there is intentionally put there by its author, God. But what we see throughout the book is that God uses various individuals to write each of the 66 books contained in our copies of God's word. The Apostle Peter proclaims this glorious truth in 1 Peter 2, verses 2 through 21, writing, No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible that you hold in your hands, be it digital or be it a hard copy, has come to you by the work of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God himself. And it was produced by him working in various ways through the lives of various men. The question is, Who did God use to pen the words we find in the Gospel of Mark? Our initial answer must be that as we look through the book of Mark, we never find any verse that gives a direct answer to our question. In fact, unlike the letters of Peter, Paul, and John, all four of these Gospels are anonymous. Nevertheless, we're not completely left in the dark on the question of authorship. The oldest, that means the, the earliest manuscripts or copies of this gospel contain this title, the gospel according to Mark. But it's more when we consider early church history and tradition, we find very strong evidence that identifies the author as John Mark, John Mark who worked with both Paul and Peter. For example, history gives us the words of John the Elder, which were written in 95 AD. Let me read those words for you. This is, this is written within a lifetime of Christ. Within less than a lifetime of P- Peter and Paul's death. John the Elder, writing in 95 AD, says, Mark became Peter's interpreter 
and wrote down accurately, but not in order, all that he remembered of the things said and done by the Lord. For he had not heard the Lord or been one of his followers, but later, as I said, a follower of Peter. Peter used to teach as the occasion demanded without giving systematic arrangement of the Lord's sayings, so that Mark did not commit error in writing down some things just as he recalled them. For he had one overriding purpose, to omit nothing. That means to leave nothing out that he had heard and to make no false statements in his account. John the Elder's account confirms Mark as the author of this gospel, words which he wrote down having sat under the preaching ministry of Peter, Christ's apostle, Christ's disciple. There are a number of other accounts like it. Let me share with you just one more from the second century. This came from a a, a very old prologue to Mark. Mark, who was called stump-fingered, if you're stump-fingered, be encouraged. Mark, who was called stump-fingered because of the size of the rest of his body, he had fingers that were too short. He was Peter's interpreter. After the departure or death of Peter himself, the same man wrote his gospel in the regions of Italy. Both of these accounts and others I have not read inform us that the words we're reading in Mark come originally from stories he received from Peter himself. From both the Bible and ancient church tradition, we're left with the impression that probably both Peter and Paul died in Rome under the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. So it would make perfect sense that Brother Mark's book would have been written in Rome. Now if we were to discover that this is actually not accurate, these facts that we have from church history are not accurate, it actually would not change anything of the content of the book nor its authority, nor its inerrancy. Nevertheless, we do find this strong evidence from church history and tradition which informs us Mark is giving us the account of Peter as he received it from Peter. Now the question is, why does that matter? Why am I telling you that today? It matters because we need to remember the means by which God's word comes to us so as to be precise in our interpretation. The Gospel of Mark did not first come to me, it didn't first come to you, it didn't come to us in Addis Ababa in 2022 with all of our current crises. First and foremost, it probably came to pagan Rome in the first century, to those Christians and those that would hear it with all of their crises. And this helps us to more accurately understand its content. When we read a book, we want to know who was the author and who, what was his original intention. It was John Mark most likely writing to Rome. But who is this John Mark? Somewhat obscure figure in the New Testament. John Mark certainly was not one of the New Testament's main characters. In fact, if someone else doesn't go and point out his significance to you, it's very easy for the untrained eye to perhaps completely skip over his character altogether. John who? Who are we talking about? But if the brother wrote this book that we're about to study, and we can at least spend just a a minute, just a little bit of time getting to know Brother John Mark, we're first introduced to John Mark in Acts 12. 12. No need to turn, to the, turn there in your Bibles, but if you're taking notes, we're first introduced to John Mark in Acts 12.12, 12, after an angel frees Peter from prison in Jerusalem. Once released, the apostle Peter went to the house of one woman named Mary, and we're, we're informed that Mary was the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. Where many of the disciples were gathered together and were praying. Then we turn to Colossians 4 and we discover that John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. Do you remember Barnabas? Paul's ministry partner. Well, in Acts 12, 5, John Mark sails with both his cousin Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, 
on a trip to Antioch to bring famine relief. And while in Antioch, the Holy Spirit sets apart both Barnabas and Paul for their first ministry trip. And we discover that John Mark accompanies them as their assistant, as Acts 13, 5 informs us. And then they arrived in Perga, which is in modern-day Turkey. For some reason, John Mark suddenly left them there at Perga, there in Turkey. He, he leaves them, and he goes back to Jerusalem. When John Mark decided to leave, uh, this left a lasting and a negative impression. It left a bad taste in the mouth of Paul. It left a, a negative impression in the mind of Paul. We don't know why Mark left, but whatever the reason, Paul's trust in John Mark appears to have been broken. So much so that later in Acts 15, when Paul and Barnabas had returned to Antioch, and when they began discussing the idea of taking yet another, a second missionary trip, the issue of John Mark caused a ministry split. Let me read that text for you. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commanded by the brothers to the grace, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. So here we learn... Here we learn in Acts that ministry splitting did not begin in 1054 with the great schism that separated the Western and the Eastern Church, Roman Catholic Church from the Eastern Orthodox. Ministry splitting did not begin either with Martin Luther's Reformation in 1517, over 500 years ago nor with the many divided denominations since the Reformation. No, ministry division began all the way back in the Bible with people just like you. People just like me. And a man named John Mark, probably a very immature young man, he was the original cause. Paul didn't want to do ministry with this brother. And Paul didn't want to do ministry with anyone who wanted to do ministry with this brother brother. And sadly, we've, we, we never hear anything else of this John Mark in the entirety of the book of Acts. Thankfully, the Christian story does not end with the book of Acts. Thankfully, John Mark's story doesn't end with the book of Acts. Towards the end of Paul's life, we find that apparently these two Christian men were reconciled. So much so that indeed they became ministry partners once again. In both Colossians and Philemon, Paul sends the recipients of his letters greetings from Mark, who was visiting or perhaps even living with Paul while he was in prison in Rome. And then finally, at the very end of Paul's life, the very end of Paul's life as he's penning his last books, As he's wasting away in a Roman prison, he says, everyone has forsaken me. Everyone has forsaken me. My ministry partners are gone. All of my friends have departed except for one, Luke. And who does Paul ask for? What friend does Paul want around him at the end of his life as he prepares to face execution? Writing, To Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.11, he says, Get Mark. Don't Don't let the power of this pass you by. Paul, writing from prison, writes to Timothy, says, Get Mark. That brother that caused that church split decades ago, bring him with you. For he's very useful to me for ministry. Brother Paul wanted to be with Brother Mark. What a reminder the author of this gospel is that in Christianity, we don't end the race the same way that we started. Today, if you don't like what you see when you look in the mirror, you're not alone. Remember Mark. 
God wasn't finished with John Mark when John Mark caused a ministry split. And God wasn't finished with the great Apostle Paul. Mark went on to become one of Paul's closest and most useful friends and ministry partners. Peter too would claim Mark as his own spiritual son in 1 Peter chapter 5. God wasn't finished with Mark. And brother, sister, God, God's not finished with you. He loves you. And he's molding you. And he's changing you. And if you trust him, he'll use you. Just like he used John, Mark, And today, we embark on our study of this man's gospel. And I have to tell you that this man, John Mark, he's been endeared to me because the Holy Spirit so used him to give us Jesus. To give you Jesus. One of four gospels comes to us from this man. And faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of Christ. And because Mark, because Mark because of his life, because of him writing these words, we get to hear the word of Christ and grow in faith. Faith of Jesus, precious Jesus. Let's thank the Holy Spirit for Brother John Mark. And with that, we come to the second question, the question of Mark's theme. Question two, what is the theme of Mark's gospel? What is the theme of Mark's gospel? Looking at verse 1 together, we read, The beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This one verse could stand as the title for this entire book. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And a fitting title it would be, for this is the glorious message. It is the precious and glorious theme of this book. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What we will discover as we expositionally walk, as we expositionally work our way through this book, as we systematically walk through this book together, is the great theme of the person of Jesus Christ. The person of Christ, the person of Christ is what stands at the center of every single story in Mark, save two which have John the Baptist briefly at the center. John the Baptist briefly takes center stage. Yet even in those two examples, John the Baptist takes center stage only to prepare the spotlight to be cast upon the one who is greater than he. Christ's person is the central theme of this book. From the beginning to the end. And unlike the other three Gospels, in Mark we find comparatively little concerning the teachings of Christ. We find little by way of His sermon proclamation. Instead, in Mark's Gospel, we see Christ living and working and acting. He's depicted as a man of action. In Mark, we learn about Jesus by what He does more than by what He says. It's as though Mark is endeavoring to reveal Jesus Christ not as an idea, not as a set of doctrines, not a set of concepts, but Mark's great goal is for you to know the person of Jesus Christ, that the eyes of your heart might be opened and enlightened so that you might see him. And like his disciples, you may lie down, lay down whatever you hold dear to your heart. That is, so that you might follow Christ, who is more precious. Here in Mark, we don't sit at the feet of a great teacher like we do in Matthew. Rather, we're sucked into a great painting in which we become a part, a part of the unfolding drama. And we'll see Jesus Christ, a man like you and like I. And as a man, we'll watch our Savior as he experiences human emotions. 
In his commentary on Mark, scholar James Edward writes, Mark is the most ready of the four evangelists. That's a reference to the Gospels. Mark is the, the most ready of the four evangelists to portray the humanness of Jesus, including sorrow, disappointment, displeasure, anger, amazement, fatigue, and even ignorance. And perhaps more than anything, as we enter into the drama of Mark, we're going to see three very important characteristics of his person. As we study this book together, you should be looking, you should be looking for the following three characteristics in Jesus. As we walk through this book together, here's what I want you to be looking for. Number one, look for Christ's divine authority. Look for Christ's divine authority. Number two, Christ's mission as God's suffering servant. And three, Christ's divine sonship. For the remainder of this sermon, we're going to drop down into each of these three characteristics. Characteristic number one, Christ's divine authority. As we turn through the pages of Mark, is there any characteristic that is more astonishing, that pops to the other characters, those who follow Christ? Is there any characteristic which offends his enemies more than his divine authority? Halfway through his first chapter, Christ is seen teaching as others cannot and also casting demons out of possessed individuals. Both are done with authority. Who is this that even the demons are subjected to? In chapter 3, he calls his disciples to come and follow him. It's not an invitation, I have a party, come if you will. It's an authoritative call, and each one does so. Application for everyone whose ears these words would land upon. It's no different. It's a command to follow him. You and I, the readers of this book, are being called upon to become disciples of this one who has authority. And so great is this one's authority that one day, if you don't bow now, if you don't follow now, you will later. For every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So the question is, when, when will you bow to this authority? Will you bow? Will you submit? Will you follow in this life? Or will you wait for the next and then in chapter 12, with authority, Christ has the audacity to declare what does and what does not belong to the emperor of Rome, Caesar. He continues to demonstrate this sort of authority in chapter 7 when he actually redefines Old Testament commandments and even violently, verbally attacks the Pharisaical traditions, declaring to the religious leaders, you, you actually leave the commandment of God to hold to the tradition of men. Something that each and every one of us in this room is prone to do. And if you don't feel that temptation in yourself, if you don't know it, then you don't know yourself. Each of us is prone to care more of what man thinks of us than we do of what God thinks. And Christ's authority, it comes and it confronts us and it ought to stop us in our tracks. Christ's authority allows him to embrace a leper without becoming unclean, something the Old Testament forbid. Christ's authority is what causes him to spend his time with sinners, tax collectors, even while the religious leaders judge him. Christ's authority drives him to the cursed and to the unclean Gentiles. Christ's authority is the reason he heals on the Sabbath. And finally, Christ's authority is what gives him the right to do what only God can do. He speaks to the waves and the wind, and they listen. And whose voice, he whose voice and authority spoke those elements into existence, still has authority over those elements as a man down below. And John, John the Baptist, as the last of the Old Testament prophets, he came baptizing with water. But Jesus, 
And only Jesus has the authority to baptize with the Holy Spirit, for He is greater. And if you're a Christian here today, if you're a Christian here today, if you've believed in Christ Jesus for salvation from sins, it's because Christ in His authority came and He did this to you. He came and He baptized you with the Holy Spirit, which means He, He and not you, caused you to be born again. It is with the Holy Spirit that one is born again. That means to be regenerated. You were not regenerated because you believed. You believed because you were generated. And if you're not a Christian and you're here with us today, that's actually your greatest need. You, like these leopards, not leopards, lepers. <laughs> Leopard can't change its spots. You, like these leopards, <laughs> you, like these lepers, and you, like these Gentiles, you need Christ to come and you need him to make you new, to, to put a heart of flesh where there's a heart of stone. You need him to touch your heart. You need him to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And only Christ, only Christ has the authority to do that. Indeed, we find in chapter 2, he even has authority to forgive sins. This is nothing other than the authority of God himself wrapped in the flesh of man. And yet, even though he has the authority of God, we see in the second characteristic that he's also humble. The one who has the authority of God is humble. For he is God's suffering servant. That brings us to our second characteristic of Christ in the Gospel of Mark. Christ's mission as God's suffering servant. Second characteristic is that of Christ's mission as God's suffering servant. If you or I were to be given the authority of Christ, considering the nature of man, we would certainly use that authority for personal gain. We would use that authority to accumulate wealth, to give ourselves more power. Perhaps you would give yourself some superhuman ability to play football, like our brother over here. Maybe head into the, the, the Premier League. As for me, if I had this authority, I know exactly what I would do. I would walk up to this brother right here and I would steal his voice. And I would become Michael Jackson reincarnated. And I would sparkle and shine like gold. You guys would come to my concerts. And you would say, yes, but he's singing Zephan. We cannot go. And then others of you would say, yes, but it's the voice of an angel. We must. <laughs> if you or I had the authority of Jesus, we'd undoubtedly use it for our own good, as we see many a Pente church doing. Many a false prophet's claim to ministry is their so-called power and authority that has been given to them by God. And you need look no further than their lavish homes, their accumulation of wealth, and their leadership styles to note that they are sinfully using their so-called power for their own good. But Jesus is nothing like these religious leaders. He's nothing like the religious leaders in our city. He used his authority in the service of others. In Mark's gospel, Christ is presented to the reader as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies of a future suffering servant of God. In Isaiah 53, we're informed that the servant of God will actually die. He will ultimately die under the wrath of God as a substitute for sinful men in order to save them. We see this in Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Indeed, we find that God the Father is found to be punishing God the Son for the sin of man. Isaiah 53, 10 says, Yet it was the will of the Lord. It was pleasurable to the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. 
when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The Son of God became the Son of Man to serve. Chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus is found declaring the great purpose, his great purpose. He says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ's greatest act of service is seen as he is pierced, as he is pierced to a tree for sin. And this characteristic of Christ as the suffering servant, you and I will be brought into Mark's Subthemes. What are these subthemes that you and I are going to be brought into? Mark's subthemes of discipleship and journey. We're bidden to come and to follow this suffering servant on his journey to the cross. His face is set, and it's set towards the cross. And if no servant is above his master, we should fully anticipate that we too will suffer on our journey with Christ. Brothers and sisters of Trinity Fellowship, if 2020 and 2021 have taught us anything, it's that these false prophets, these false apostles, they're just false damned liars. Their message of a prosperity gospel, it didn't save our loved ones from dying, contracting COVID-19 or getting cancer this year. Their prosperity gospel, it didn't stop women from being raped in the north and dead body being stacked upon dead body and graves. Oh no, Christ, Christ as the suffering servant of God teaches us the very opposite of what the prosperity gospel teaches us. Through the proclamation of Christ, we receive a a theology of suffering from this book of Mark. We receive a, a theology of suffering from Christ, our leader. The suffering servant, through the proclamation of Christ, we we receive a a, a theology of suffering that affects how we think, how we live in a difficult and a fallen sinful world, so that as we follow Jesus, we can be sure, like our master in front of us, we're going to experience confusion, difficulty, fiery trials. Attacks from the enemy, heartache, loss, persecution, and pain. But friend, there is a pain that you and I will never experience as followers on this journey with Christ. The book of Mark, we can break it up into two halves, and the first half regards Christ's ministry in Galilee, northern Israel. And you'll notice that Mark uses this word immediately, over and over, and you get the rhythm, you get the the fast pace of this book. It connects one scene to another, but then as the drama unfolds and as we come to the second half of the journey with Christ, everything begins to change. Everything changes in chapter 8 for everything. Slows. Way. Way way down as Christ sets his face for Jerusalem. It's as a Hollywood movie in which the action is suddenly put into slow motion so that you can hear the second hand on the watch as it goes tick, 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 tick. Everything changes when Christ asks his disciples in chapter 8, verse 29. Who do people say that I am? And Peter gives the great confession, you are the Christ, meaning the Messiah. But then to their surprise, Jesus informs them that he's not the kind of Messiah that they had imagined. He's not the kind of Messiah that the Pharisees were waiting for. He's not the kind of Messiah that the Israelites were waiting for. He had not come to overthrow Rome or to destroy the enemies of Israel as their great political savior. Instead, instead as the suffering servant, the son of man, he he must suffer. He must suffer many things. 
He must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And what is this? He must be killed. And after three days rise again, what kind of Messiah is this? What is he talking about? The first half of Mark is dedicated to years of Christ's ministry, whereas the second half of the book is dedicated to the final weeks of his life. Time slows down so that as we journey with him, we, we, we recognize something has changed. At some point, you and I will abandon him. Indeed, God the Father will abandon him. There on the cross, Christ will know a pain that you and I, we will never have to know. That is, if by faith we trust in Him. If we have faith in Him, we'll never have to know the pain of paying the consequence, the ultimate consequence of our sins. The sin that you and I, that we enjoyed committing, we took deep pleasure in it, for that now he is seen to be suffering. The sin that we held so close and we pet it like it's some, some precious pet, some precious animal that we take care of. There on the cross, the Lamb of God is dying for it. There on the cross, the suffering servant of God cried out, My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? Why was he forsaken? He was forsaken because a holy God cannot have anything whatsoever to do with sinful men and sinful women. And at the cross, Christ became sin for you. He became the very embodiment of your sinful actions. All the sinful actions. All the sinful actions from that young toddler age as a, as a young baby throwing fits all the way to old age and your pride and your conceit and wanting everybody to care about what you think. All of that. Your teenage years. Those scenes you would not let anybody see. There he is on the cross dying for them. And our discipleship, our following of Christ it will certainly mean suffering as well. You and I will never know the wrath of God as did the suffering servant of God. For that service was a one-time act that will never be repeated. Sin has been atoned for. And that is why we can have full confidence. If you believe in Jesus, you, friend, will be reconciled to God. A God who loves you. A God who deeply loves you and he demonstrated it, he proved it once and for all by putting his own son to death so that you will never know that pain in this life or in an eternity of eternities in hell. The third and final major characteristic that we see in Jesus is that this Christ, this Messiah, is also the Son of God. The third characteristic that we see in Jesus is that he is the son of God. We've seen his authority. We've seen that he's God's suffering servant. Finally, we see that he is the son of God. Chapter 1, verse 1 begins with a proclamation that this truth by the narrator and throughout this gospel we're going to see in chapter 1. At Christ's baptism, God the Father declares Jesus to be the Son of God. Friend, He doesn't need your testimony. Indeed, Christ is knocking on your heart, but it's not because He needs you. He doesn't need you to make this great confession. God the Father makes this great translate, translation, this great proclamation. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. In chapters 3 and 5, even the demons declare Jesus to be the Son of God. God declares Him to be the Son of God. Satan declares Him to be the Son of God. Throughout this Gospel, Jesus is given a number of titles, including Teacher, Rabbi, Son of David, Lord, and Son of Man. And in chapter 8, we have Peter's great confession, confession You are the Christ. But this, this most sacred of titles, Son of God. 
This undoubtedly is the most important of all Jesus' titles. For in it the grand revelation of Christ's identity is made known. Indeed, Christ's identity as the Son of God is why he has the authority and it is why he is able to serve as the sin-atoning Lamb of God. But the interesting thing in this book, the interesting thing in this book is who can see it. Who has the eyes to see it? Who has the eyes to see Christ's true identity? And this brings us to two more sub-themes. In Mark, we find insiders and outsiders. That's one theme. Another theme is that of faith. We find insiders and outsiders. Those who should be on the inside with faith are most often, more oftener than not, found to actually be on the outside. Chapter 4, verse 11, Jesus says to his disciples, To you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed hear, but not understand. Christ has an inside group to whom he reveals the secrets of the kingdom of God, and there is an outside group to whom he does not reveal those secrets. But here's what's most surprising. Here's what's most surprising. Those who belong to each group, those who believe, belong to each group might surprise you. Those, excuse me, who should be in the inside are oftener than not found to be on the outside. Mary, Mary Jesus' mother, and his siblings in chapter 3 are on the outside. All those following Christ are inside the home listening to the Son of God. And the religious leaders of Israel who memorize this book and preach God's word, they're on the outside because they can't see that all of Scripture is testifying of me, as Christ says. To our surprise, we find Gentiles, those who are dirty, we find women. And this is odd. This is odd in ancient Near Eastern literature to find women lifted up as the example of faith. We find those who are sinful or ceremoniously unclean, second class citizens, third class citizens. They're found to actually be on the inside. Chapter 1 an unclean leper goes outside his boundaries by approaching Jesus on the inside for healing. Chapter 2, four unidentified individuals are commended for their faith as they lower their sick friend through the roof. Christ commends them. Chapter 5, an unclean hemorrhaging woman touches him, something forbidden in Israel. And if these are stories that have lost their power to you, it's because you know nothing of the experience of living in Israel 2,000 years ago, where you were not welcomed on the inside. In chapter 7, a Gentile woman, Gentiles being cursed and unclean, a Syrophoenician woman's faith drives her to seek out healing for her daughter. We could go on and on all the way through this book, but it all climaxes with the confession of a Gentile soldier in chapter 15. The centurion, a Jew, and not a Gentile, nor even one of Christ's disciples, an enemy of Christ who helped crucify him. The centurion is seen as he beholds Christ's final breath. And he declares, truly, this man was the Son of God. Truly, this man was the Son of God. It was not the Jewish people who had eyes of faith to see Christ's true identity as the Son of God, Rather, it was the have-nots, the poor, and the unclean. This theme of insiders and outsiders, it serves us well because we as a church, we're about to begin membership at Trinity Fellowship. 
But we live in a city and in a country in which the majority claim some sort of belief in Christ. And simply saying, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, doesn't really draw any lines between insiders and outsiders. And this sub-theme, this sub-theme serves us. And it sobers us up so as to think solemnly and seriously. Yes, it even tests the authenticity of our confession. Showing whether or not you and I Indeed, are insiders. Who is and who is not a member of Christ's holy church? Who and what a Christian is and what he is not? And the great confession of that centurion, brothers and sisters, it is to be the great confession of each of us. For there at the cross we find that Peter's Christ is also the Son of God. The key to understanding this Son of God, the key to, to understanding Him, is found in His suffering. There at the cross, we discover that God's suffering servant is none other than God's own Son. And indeed, this is the one that we have been called upon to follow. And for those who do, friend, if you do, if you do follow Christ, there will be suffering. And we will follow him to the top of Golgotha. But friend, we stop at Golgotha and we go no for further. For those of us who do follow Christ, for those of us who have ears to hear and eyes to see, whose hearts have not been hardened, there at the foot of the cross we stop and we go no further. As we see there at the far foot of the cross, the Son of God is raised up and He is suspended and lifted up between God and heaven, between us and heaven between us and our God. And there at the foot of the cross, as we look up, we behold as God thunders down His wrath, which is due to you and to me. Jesus, the propitiation of all that righteous wrath, absorbs it. He absorbs it. He absorbs that thundering wrath until He's crushed. And down the cross, the Son of God's pressed blood does drip and drop to each of us, his followers, who look on in faith there at the foot of the cross through the substitutionary death of none other than the Son of God incarnate. We look upon a man who looks and sounds just like us, only he is without sin, yet bearing our sin. And as his blood drips and as it drops down on us, as it runs down that old rugged cross, it comes upon us, upon our heads, down to our feet, Feet, and it washes us, making us as white as snow. And then we hear him. We hear him as his, his loud cry goes out that it is finished. And his body goes limp. And it turns deathly pale. For the blood has run out of him and onto us. He hangs his head in death. While we, lifting our heads, with confidence for the first time to the heavens. We cry out for the first time, Abba Father! Abba Father! Oh, you are mine! You are mine! Abba Father! Oh, with confidence I come near! Oh, with confidence I draw near to the throne of grace! I draw near to the throne of grace! Abba Father! God the Father made His Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We look to our Father with confidence. For He gave up His only begotten Son so as to bring many sons to glory. Hallelujah. And then the book ends. Shortly thereafter it ends, unlike the other Gospels, Mark ends without his disciples having seen the risen Christ. It's not like the other Gospels. Instead, a number of his followers, they go to the tomb early in the morning on the third day to anoint his body with spices. But as they were approaching, to their surprise, the stone had been rolled away. 
And they entered into the tomb. And they found an angel who told them, Christ is risen. He's not here. And the angel tells them to go and to report to the disciples to meet Jesus in Jerusalem in Galilee. You're not going to find him here. Go and find him in Galilee. And then the book ends. Why do we not learn more in Mark's gospel? Why do we not see the risen Savior? Why do we not see the drama end with Jesus as it began and his disciples beholding the risen Savior who had called them chapters before? It's as though Mark has a question for you. John Mark has a question for you. Do you believe? Do you have faith to see that which is unseen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Friends, John Mark never saw the crucified and risen Son of God. But John Mark was an insider. He believed, and he wrote this gospel so that you would believe. Are you an insider? Are you an insider too? Do you believe? Will you follow the Son of God?